Metallica, here they come, the kings of metal. Hey, this is Squindo, and you're listening to Metal Up Your Podcast. Never care for what they say. Never care for games they play. Never care for what they do. Never care for what they know. And I Welcome to Middle Up Your Podcast. I'm Ethan Look. And I'm Clint Wells. This is episode 196, and we're talking to Adam Dubin, who you might know who did A Year in the Half in Life of Metallica, and of course, Murder in the Front Row, which you've probably heard that episode already. So we're pretty excited to talk to him again. Yeah, we had a great conversation with Adam. We were going to let this just be a normal Monday episode, but we thought with the Murder in the Front Row episode coming out this week, and then we had just such a great conversation with Adam, we were like, let's just put it out as a, it's not even a bonus episode, You just it's just two fully-fledged Metal Up Your Podcast episodes in one week. I guess we just decided to just be the the Metallic Claws of podcasts. That's right, yeah. I mean, Adam, this week, this week Adam is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> well, he's done so many amazing things, you know, you're going to hear it in the interview, but uh, he also directed A Year and a Half in the Life of Metallica, which is just as important to me as you know, Seattle 89 and Mexico City, Binge mm-hmm. and Purge. It's just that aesthetic of that documentary is just a huge part of when I came online with the band. Yeah. But but of course, he also did Freeze Them All. Uh, he did uh, the making of the Through the Never film. We talk all about him coming up in the New York scene. He was roommates with Rick Rubin. He directed the videos, co-directed, I should say, uh, the videos for Fight for Your Right to Party by the Beastie Boys, No Sleep Till Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Went on tour with Metallica. I mean, just all this stuff, all these iconic scenes. And yes, we do talk about Rome Guy. Uh, probably wherever I may roam. Uh, just the fact that it's bug. You know, even after you die, you can hopefully go on, you know. Rome Guy. The, the, the hunt continues. As of the early 90s, he was still in the New England area. So we can hopefully track them down one day so i'm looking forward to that we're gonna do the normal we're gonna knock out the housekeeping before we hear from adam and uh let's just do that real quick so if you like the show leave us a positive review on itunes in fact uh was it last month we did a we gave away snm2 vinyl that's right yeah. as an itunes contest and we're going to do that now adam has been kind enough to send us a copy of murder in the front row and then i'm also going to donate my personal copy of murder in the front row Mm-hmm. And we're going to do another iTunes contest. So anyone who left the review for the SNM2 contest, you're going to be in the hat also. This is US only. And uh, all you got to do is just go to iTunes, leave us a positive review, and we will draw two names and give away two of these DVDs of Murder in the Front Row, which you've already heard our thoughts about it. We we love this documentary. It's badass. It's so awesome. Yeah, it's very well done. The animation's great. I mean, the amount of interviews they got is just unreal. And, uh, and also regarding the uh, DVD giveaway, both of them, if your review, like Clint said, also if you submitted it for the S and M vinyl, it will also count September first and on. So at any time in September, if you left a review, you are eligible. So you know what to do. Go over there. It really goes a long way. A lot of people have a lot of options when it comes to podcasts, and what they do is they look at that positive review number right next to it, and they go, oh, "Okay, I trust that because those right. numbers mean something. They mean that." We've made a show that hopefully has value for you all out there. So mm-hmm. it only takes a second. It's the easiest way to support the show. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to spend any money, and we're going to give you shit for doing it. It really is the easiest thing you can do. Oh, and let me add something, by the way, Clint. Go ahead. We have been announcing these winners via Instagram Live, and we ran into a hiccup uh, the last giveaway or two where people just didn't show up for it. So you must be on Instagram Live. We'll, we'll post about it when we're going to announce the winners, but... It, we're going to give you like 30 seconds after, you know, it doesn't take long to type, hey, that's me. 
So make sure you get on Instagram Live when we announce this stuff. Yeah, and you know, you really should be following us on the socials anyway because we do a lot of fun stuff over there. I mean, we interact on the socials every day. So it's a good place not only to 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 win stuff like that, but also to sort of keep up with what's going on with the podcast, to get connected with other Metal Up Your Podcast family. If you really dig the show, you can become a patron. If you don't know what that is, it's just a way for you to kick back to the show with a little bit of financial support. Um, how many times, Ethan, have people said they would love to buy us a beer? Oh, my gosh. Um, it, it's it's countless at this point. I mean, if we were able to drink all the beers that have been offered to us in one day, we would both probably die or at least be rushed to the hospital. So here's how you got to think about the Patreon, okay? Because we're not getting rich over there. It's just supporting the show. It's helping us pay for things like the EPs and pay for things like all the giveaways and, you know, shipping the Rome guy shirts all over the world was a little more expensive than I, than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. But it helps pay for all that. We, we didn't have to spend money out of our own pockets to make sure that we could take care of the family. So uh, if you just want to think about it as buying me and Ethan a beer a month, that's just a good way to frame it in your mind. If you like that's the right. podcast, if you think it has value, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Metal Every Podcast. We have four new patrons. And I think mo- a lot of these are returning. Dan Cantor, our buddy Dan Cantor. Dan Cantor. If you don't know Dan, Dan's a, a great friend of ours, a wonderful musician. We did an episode with Dan Ah, oh, shoot, a year ago? I can't remember, it's but go been look for six that. Six years ago. He's he's the guy playing the Zach Wild Les Paul on SNL with Justin Bieber. We'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah, you pretty crazy. That story. And I shall everyone is hearing it here first. I shall now dub him the sweetheart of the North. The sweetheart because he's up there in in Canada, right? He is, yeah. He's the sweetheart of the North. All right, the sweetie pie of the North. Uh Thomas Joswiak, who I recognize from the forums, TJ, which we met TJ when we were in uh at the gig we went to. Where was that? Detroit? Detroit, yeah. Wayne Summers became a patron. Wayne. For people who don't know, Wayne Summers, who we've also done an episode with, is the dude who found the long lost Master of Puppets backdrop, bought it with his own money. And then donated it back to Metallica, who were so happy to get it back. We have a whole episode on that story. Yeah, Wayne became a patron. And then Jeremy Fulbright. So we want to say thank you. <laughs> Quite the illustrious list of patrons today. I know. Hooray. Now, you're supporting the show over at Patreon, but that's not it. We give away so much stuff to patrons. In fact, that's right. we gave a justice box set, I think, to Dan when he was a patron before. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we gave away we've given away tickets, Sling Castle, S and M two. Yeah, that's right. We sent Chad and his wife all the way to California to see S and M two. And if you sign up now, we'll give you a luxurious vacation to Delaware. <laughs> Hi, I'm in Delaware. Imagine being able to be magically whisked away to Delaware. Hi, I'm in Delaware. What if that's a, a gift in the future? Uh, Just a day t- trip to Delaware. Two tickets to Delaware. <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna set you up at the Days Inn there on Main Street. That's right in, in Dover, and uh, yeah, you're gonna have a great time. I think you're really gonna have a good time. Here's the deal: we're not done giving shit away over there either. I'm telling you, dude, we we became the Christmas podcast. I know we celebrate Christmas year round. Because here's what we're doing over at Patreon for the giveaway: is we are giving away the deluxe S and M two box set, the deluxe, which comes with all the goodies, all the sauce. So we'll be doing that drawing coming up. I want to thank Namarta Kalia for donating that box set to us to give away to patrons. Now, do you want to talk a little bit about your lockdown pre order? Yeah, man. Uh, so a, a lot of our patrons will recognize five of the six of these songs I'm putting out on this cover EP called Lockdown. I'm putting it out on my birthday, October 16th, which is a week from Friday, or as you're listening to this, a week from tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I did was, rather than just uh, put those songs out as is, I added uh, live horns to it, more keyboards. Uh, my friend Hannah, who sang on my other record, did backup vocals. Uh, I had them properly mixed by Nathan Thomas, who did a cover with Black and EPs. And I added an extra song, Mad World by Tears for Fears, and you can pre-order it on iTunes right now. And uh, yeah, it'll be everywhere. You get music, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, blah, blah, blah. I am looking into physical copies, but if you want to go pre-order it now, head over to the old iTunes and uh, clickety-clack. And we, um, in sort of in, in a way to get everyone excited about that, all of our quarantine covers that are not on that album that you have coming out called mm-hmm. Lockdown on your birthday uh, are on our band camp for free. Well, it's really pay what you want. So, right. which means zero dollars if that's what you want to do, which is totally fine. And you can stream it for free. And all of our cover Our World Blackens are over on Bandcamp as well. But you could also listen. I think all of our cover Our Blackens are on Spotify. But yes. the Bandcamp page is kind of a direct 
place of support for us if you want that music. But again, our quarantine covers, 26 of them, minus the five that are going to be on your EP, Mm -hmm. are available for free over at our Bandcamp. So there's a lot of, again, with the Christmas spirit, just putting out a lot of music. A lot of good stuff. All right. The easiest way to get a hold of us is our email address, which is metalupyourpodcastshow at gmail.com. We love hearing from the family. Absolutely love hearing from you guys. And uh, we get more emails than we can read a week, but we do read them all. We choose five for the show, and we're going to do that now. What we lovingly refer to as the The email portal. Okay, our first email is from Kate Kofstad. She says, hey, Clinton, Ethan. I just want to say how much I appreciated your tribute episode to Eddie Van Halen. That was just dropped the other day. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, When I heard the news, I was truly heartbroken. Just losing someone who was such an inspiration and loved by so many just hit me really hard. Even as, uh, sorry, even as a much younger fan. So to help me out, in addition to your episode, I took the time to burn down 1984 front to back. Also, I want to uh, send all my love out to his family, friends, to all the other fans who were touched by his music. May he rest easy, and I hope he's up there jamming with the rest of the greats. That is from Kate from Silverton, Oregon, New Jersey. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Chris Ernst says, longtime listener, first-time emailer, love the podcast. The content is killer, and your production is second to none. His words, not mine. I know. Those are his words. I didn't say it. He says, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 80s and was able to see some of these bands in their natural element. He's talking about the, uh, this is in response to our Murder in the Front Row episode. He says, a couple of these bands I think you would really dig, and I bet you'd get an interview episode or two out of them. Metallica really kicked the door open for all these guys. And he mentions these two bands that I'm excited to dive into, uh, but I wanted to list them for our listeners who, who maybe could get into this too. I'm sure a lot of our listeners will have already heard of these bands. Uh, He says, Death Angel, a bunch of Filipino cousins from a thrash band when they were kids. Check out the Ultra Violence, their first album. I believe Kirk Hammett produced their first demo. A little bit of trivia. And then he talks about the band Forbidden. He says, Think Heavy Iron Maiden. uh, This band's founding members went on to bigger things. Rob Flynn of Machine Head, Paul Bostaff of Slayer, and Craig Losacero of Man Man God and his new venture, Dress the Dead. Mm. Their debut album is good, but Twisted into Form is much better, and Green is a masterpiece. Craig's other band, Man May God, produced by Rick Rubin, is worth checking out. Very so cool. I'm excited to go dig into some of these. I yeah. know I got real excited about the band Possessed during the documentary, just because of all their satanic imagery. Did you dip into that? I haven't yet. I haven't yet. I was really hoping you were gonna you, you were gonna crank that in your car and peel out of the smokestack. Taking oh off yeah, all fast, I was gonna like a- just drive to the nearest tattoo shop and get a pentagram tattoo on my <laughs> chest. But no, and you know now with Eddie passing away, I mean I'm kind of on like many people around the whole world. I'm kind of on a Van Halen. I, I was listening to Van Halen like all night last night. Yeah, so. I listened to a bunch of Van Halen last night as well, and then also found out late last night right before I went to bed. Uh, this is metal at all, but uh, uh, the singer Johnny Nash passed away at the age of eighty. I saw he, that. He, uh, most of you would probably know the song I, I Can See Clearly Now. Amazing artist if you want to dip into some really cool, chill, uh, soul, reggae, pop. Uh, he, uh, back in the day, man, he was the, one of the first um, non-Jamaicans to record reggae music in Jamaica, which is amazing. And he signed Bob Marley to his first publishing deal. Huh. Just really cool uh, history of that guy. But Very cool. Yeah. Well, rest in peace to him, too. Yes, absolutely. Our next email is from Ridge Ryan. I'd like to imagine he's writing this from like a ridge overlooking something right um hey guys huge fan of the podcast i just listened to your murder in the front row episode and i loved it i also went back and listened to your commentary episode specifically exploring the big four do you guys have any plans to do more of those yes we do uh if so what records and what bands i'd love to hear you guys react to megadeth euthanasia or peace cells but hey do what makes you happy anyways just want to say how much i appreciate you guys doing a show about my favorite band it helps me get through the day P.S. If you guys decide to end your lives as moles like I do. We end our lives as moles. <laughs> well, yeah, we definitely are going to cover as many of those Explore the Big Fours as we can get to. And, Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's just going to, I mean, it's just those other three bands and their big records. Which, how many How many have we done? Five or six? Something like that, yeah. And we've got a lot of Megadeth requests uh, specifically for uh, Cryptic Writings, Euthanasia, or Risk. So maybe that will be next on the table. We'll see. I, I'm, I'm still excited for Clint to hear... Um, anthrax um oh my god state of euphoria mm-hmm. uh yeah. it's 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 such a good follow-up to among the living well maybe we can crank out a uh explore the big four for next week yeah 
Thank you, Ridge Ryan. Michael Salazar writes and says, Sup, brothers. Just wanted to tell you what Eddie Van Halen meant to me. When I first started playing guitar, DVDs were just becoming a thing. I went to my local music shop one day and bought S&M on VHS and Van Halen Greatest Hits DVD with all their music videos. Had it not been for those, I might not have taken guitar as seriously. Metallica really wanted me to take practicing guitar seriously, while Eddie made me just want to be like him. His solo style speaks for itself, obviously, but I also really loved his rhythm. He had a certain finesse in his right hand that was really beautiful, especially the Hagar era. I love all Van Halen records, and I share this grief with you, a true guitar god that I'll always love and respect. Hope you're doing well. Still proud to be a patron. I hope Torben is well on his magic carpet. Peace, brothers. Michael Salazar, Brooke, Indiana, New Jersey. I'm sure Torben is just hovering above the pandemic right now. <laughs> <laughs> I see the pandemic is below me, and I say, so, I say to COVID-19, delete that. I send down a bucket and a rope so Lars can give me food. <laughs> He puts the he says he puts the lotion on his skin, <laughs> and then he laughs. But I do not get the joke. He puts he puts the salad in the basket. <laughs> All right, our last email is from Jay Middleton. What's up, brothers? As he says, no question today, just praises. My daughter has been refusing to take naps unless I drive her around. So this last weekend, I put on the Cover Our World Black and DPS. Clint's version of Fixer came on, and just and I just hit this wave of emotion, and almost felt like the song was meant to be like this originally. Uh, like I'd never heard the original, I, uh, I would have legitimately thought this was it. This was the original. I feel like both of you guys do that with certain ones, and even the quarantine covers did that as well. I worked in country radio on a morning, on a morning show, and I loved the sound of country, but I couldn't connect with the, with the content, and it really drove me crazy. While these EPs, I have found my love for that tone again, and also found a new love for reggae music. That's awesome. Thanks for bringing your talents to the show and doing what you guys do. I know we might have a f- uh, have to wait... In- a second for a new co- a cover all the black and ep but i know but it'll be worth it much love to you guys jay milton from seattle washington new jersey yeah i mean maybe we can get another one of those cranked out for christmas yeah man i guess it's i guess we usually do one a year and cover our black and four came out in january yeah but we also didn't anticipate a global pandemic or that we true. would do 26 quarantine covers yeah that's true or maybe we you know who knows maybe we can make it uh you know in lieu of having an anniversary party maybe we can do a you know, a, a new cover old black end in a in a Zoom anniversary party or something. We got a Zoom coming up soon too. And like now that all the Rome guy shirts have made their way out into the world, I want to yeah. do our next Zoom and have everybody wear their Metal Up Your Podcast shirts or their Rome guy shirts. That'd be awesome. But which, it. by the way, I sent a Rome guy shirt to Adam Dubin. So the guy yes. who made the guy who introduced us to Rome guy Fuzz Top, as he's called, now has a Rome guy shirt. I love it, and I how love how much. That? Adam and the and his crew like adored that guy. They're like, man, yeah. that was one of our favorite characters. Character I mean, fans. I, I think if he's still alive, I think we're going to find him. I think I think the vibes are good on that. I hope so. I mean, it, where, where did he say was last? Providence is Providence. where they interviewed him. That's where they interviewed him. Yeah. So I don't know, man. I I, I hope he's still alive. I hope he still goes on. Maybe he maybe he knows where Samim is too. <laughs> They're all hiding. And maybe out they all know where Paul is. Yeah, seriously. And speaking of Paul, one last thing before we split. Speaking of all this music we're putting out this year, uh, the Lunar Satan material is definitely getting done. Mm -hmm. Uh, All the extra songs have been written, and I think seven out of nine, it's going to be a full length. Uh, The artwork has been made, and seven out of the nine songs have been mixed by Paul Moak. And I've heard one of the mixes uh, in Smokestack, and it sounds killer. It just sounds like legit. I mean, it's just legit metal. It's so yeah. cool. I'm so proud of it. So there's a lot of fun sauce coming down the pike this year. There so really is. We're going to leave you now and go talk to a uh, an interview we did last week with Adam. You're going to absolutely love him uh, like we do. It's, it was nice becoming friends with him because I feel like we have a we have a nice friendship now Yeah, through the podcast. It makes me grateful for the podcast. Uh, grateful to be alive. Grateful to have great music. And uh, we'll leave you now. We'll come back and say bye after the interview, but we'll leave you now with the great Adam Dubin. Check it out. Well, here we are with Adam Dubin. Thank you, Adam, for coming on the show. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be here. Well, we will have already introduced you. People know your work. You've got a, a newish film out, Murder in the Front Row, which, by the way, we watched together this week, and we had a blast. Excellent. 
thank you. It, it's a, uh, you know, labor of love, of course. And uh, it was cool to see, you know, to dig in and see like where this all began, not just for Metallica, but for, you know, really this whole Bay Area scene that Metallica right. is of the bands that was nurtured there. Yeah. One of the things I really appreciated about it, and you've mentioned it in some of the press for the film, and we're going to talk all about the film, but mm -hmm. um, you talk about how like there was kind of a, something already happening there before Metallica. So there's this really interesting aspect of the film where it's San Francisco before Metallica, and then obviously Metallica, when they exploded, yeah. it kind of changed everything. And that that's represented pretty well in the film. I mean, like learning a lot about Exodus and Testament and all these other people was really eye-opening for me, and I've been a Metallica fan all my whole damn life. You know, it, it was cool for me. I mean, I, I, I kind of entered Metallica's world in 1990. Um, it's it's interesting. As we're talking, it's it's fully now 30 years ago. And, um, but I, you know, I kind of knew they came out of something and their history was already somewhat known. And, you know, they, they'd done all these other things and, you know, Justice for All and, and, and uh, you know, things that come before but I, I always thought, wow, it'd be nice one day to like do something to go explore where they came out of. And then, you know, some years later, Brian Liu, the co-author of the book, uh, showed it to me. And I was like, oh, there, there it is. There's my, my, my avenue in to exploring where Metallica started, you know, so I could take it back even further. One of the other cool things about it is that you kind of weren't an insider at that time. You weren't really there. So... Well, what I liked about one of the things you said about it is like, you may not have been there, which kind of gave you some objectivity about it. You know, um, mm -hmm. some, some of these insane people might be a little more tied to Ruthie's in than you having never been there. But right. you talk about how you came from your own scene. So you, you really understood the vibe of that. And then of course, like, you know, your, your New York, you know, NYU beastie boys, Rick Rubin scene. I wanted to just kind of start there. Uh, Ethan sure. and I are huge beastie boys fans. And, uh, you know, grew up watching those videos you co-directed for No Sleep Till Brooklyn and Fight for Your Right. So let's kind of start there. I mean, what was that like at that time? You're in, are you just in film school? Your roommates, Rick Rubin? I mean, what's, what's going on with that vibe? It's just the craziest thing. I mean, that's, that's pure fate and, and happenstance. But um, yeah, I, I went to, uh, I, I always wanted to make film, but I mean, I, I was, uh, you know, I love music. I mean, I, I, I I love music. Something that absolutely galvanized me was like a film like the Woodstock movie, which I saw in the theater on re-release, you know, some years later and um, anything that, that had like music and film. And I just, I, I just wanted to make films, you know, as opposed to being like a musician, I just approached it from a film point of view. Um, and I go to NYU. I wanted to make, that, that was one of the serious places you could go to study film at that time, even now. And, um, and just my roommate turns out to be this guy who's also kind of a film student, but he's also kind of interested in music very, very obviously. And it's not sure exactly what he's going to do, but he's going to do something, you know, and he's, um, and he's got this, you know, he started a record label in, in, in the dorm and it happened to be this record label called Def Jam, but <laughs> Def Jam at the time, all he had out on Def Jam was one punk record of his punk band. I mean, it was nothing like, but he loved hip hop, you know, it was very clear. He loved that at the time and it just sort of evolved you know we just sort of like kept kept on uh kept on going and and you know a friendship started and i mean you know during my time at school i did a lot of things and he did a lot of other things and he built this uh you know we, we were only roommates for one year but we lived in the dorms you know uh through the whole time and always remained friends and then of course i started working for him as soon as I got out of film school, um, I, I was working for Rick Rubin, you know, and, and, and Def Jam was now a thing, you know, it was Def Jam. Wow. Uh, but even then, it's still, it was still before the Beastie Boys videos. Um, the videos, the Beastie, when I got out of film school, the Beastie Boys were in the process of making License to Ill, but it was not an album yet. But I was hearing the tracks and I was going down to the studio and hearing them record some of the tracks uh, because I was, I was working for Rick. And, and then... Um, you know, at the time, though, we, we were focused much more on he was about to embark on directing a, a Run DMC movie called Tougher Than Leather. Yeah, uh, sure. Which he, which he did direct. And um, but there was other projects happening. And, and like the Beastie Boys were were, you know, Run DMC was already kind of happening at that point. But but the Beastie Boys, it was it was kind of obvious that everybody was going to try to, like, break them as like the next major band. I don't think anybody really thought how big it was going to get but it was um hear, hearing those early tracks and hearing them you know those guys are, are great and really smart guys i mean they came up with 
you know, they were they were writing lyrics and figuring out a lot of, you know, a lot of what was going on. It wasn't just like Rick guiding everything. I mean, the, the Beastie Boys really were were spot on with making beats and all that stuff. So it was very much a kind of a collaborative project and stuff. And uh, I think Rick just knew how to guide it at that time in a certain way. And I think I always think about the Beastie Boys after Rick Rubin, how how the the, the course that they charted and and how um, impressive and amazing it is their their body of work. Um, I, I could just tell you when the, when the album came out, there was a lot of rock criticism of the Beastie Boys that said something along the lines of like, yeah, this is kind of good, but in years from now we'll laugh at this. It'll be like a one hit wonder, you know. And <laughs> they thought Fight for Your Right or No Sleep for Brooklyn would be like, oh yeah, that song from the '80s that we all kind of laughed about. Well. You know, I think the the history's on the side of the Beastie Boys on this one. Yeah, that they were, that's yeah, were, kinda. <laughs> you know, and that, that they made music that mattered. So, um, anyway, I, I it, it was a pretty crazy time, but yeah, you know, it, it, it was really fun to to be there with Ruben and to see him just in, in, incredibly develop this this and just have it like like unfold. And and, and it really stems not so much from him having money or anything like that. It was his true interest in in hip-hop music i mean he loved that music in a way that i i did not know any other you know sort of white suburban teenagers who loved that music the way he did you yeah. know he really wanted to learn about it and and um a, a for instance was we'd go to a um a club like the roxy which was a um you know predominantly african-american club um it was uh, a true you know real hip-hop club and, uh, you know, uh, definitely in a, in a you know, kind of all these clubs are in rougher neighborhoods. I mean, you got to watch it when you went out to these places that, that, you know, it was like you were, you were not in any good part of town, nor were CBGBs, by the way, at the time either. And, you know, I would go in this club with Rick and I'd be like, you know, just kind of back up in a corner. Don't, don't get in anything with anybody. Cause it was, it was a kind of a tough place sometimes. And I'd be like, where the hell is Rick? He'd like disappeared on me. All of a sudden I look across the room, all the way up on the DJ stand is Rick. He's found his way to the DJ. <laughs> He's talking with the DJ and it's, it's like, you know, Jazzy J or somebody. And it's like, you know, it, it, it just always knocked me out. He, he just talked the common language of music and he was unafraid, you know, he was unafraid and, and right. he was so open to what was going on. He genuinely wanted to learn about this process he he never could dj the way the way those djs could i mean i'm talking like you know uh, bending the records and spinning like that i mean he could he could blend the record but he never could spin like that but he he certainly loved it and made himself a part of it and that was so genuine that you know that's really that if anything is like sort of the root of of his success i think then and, and even now with with various kinds of artists i grew up in the deep south and i, I grew up on mtv uh, i'm 37 and so the bc boys were just a huge part of um a huge part of fighting what was culturally happening in, in alabama for me with racism and hip-hop and you can't be a white kid. i mean the bc boys blew that shit open for me um and a lot of that had to do with the videos because i you know before i was able to to go to a, the mall and buy a cassette tape or a cd i was able to watch mtv so what was it like <laughs> for you working on those videos, you, you, you co-directed them with Rick Manello, yeah. who's no longer with us, but was that your first time working on a music video? And was the budget just super small? I mean, what was the vibe like for those videos? The videos were, um, I mean, they're iconic now, you know? But. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's like, this is like, like people tuning in for like Metallica stuff are going to be like, what? You know? so, <laughs> oh, they're uh, used to it with us. And, and this, I found this often that people who, who like heavy metal is something, the Beastie Boys de definitely had a, had a meaningful, you know, hit in a meaningful time for them. Right. Um, the videos, we didn't have much money. We had, we had a lot of willpower. Manello, uh, my, my great, uh, friend and co-director, um, you know, he had been, he had been a film student. He was 10 years older than kind of our gang of, of people. And he was the front desk guy from like midnight till eight in the morning, but he had been a film student at NYU and he was just kind of, that was his side gig as he was trying to get writing jobs and all this stuff. He had a steady job working at Weinstein. So we would all hang out. And by we, I mean myself, Rick Rubin, the Beastie Boys on any given night and a bunch of other people. I mean, it was sort of a whole crew of us who would hang out 
at the front desk from midnight to eight in the morning with Rick Manella. Didn't you didn't have to stay the whole time, but if you whatever time you stayed for, you got an education in 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 film and TV and maybe even life and other things in general too. So when it came time to direct this music video, I mean, I have no doubt had Rick not been up to his eyeballs in directing Tough in the Leather, he would have directed Fight for Right to Party. I have no doubt of it, mm. but. He was absolutely up to his eyeballs in, in Tough and the Leather, couldn't leave. And MTV, the song was started, the song was so good, it was starting to break all over the country. Like they were play, whatever city they played it in, people called up wanting more of that song. So MTV said, We gotta have a video in two weeks. So we're we're you know, we're holding a spot in heavy rotation, which as you guys would know, in, in heavy rotation was like the coveted thing. It was like the holy grail of promotion. Yeah. Right. Okay, and yeah. It's hard to believe now, but pre-internet, that mattered a lot. And so, you know, they needed this video. So the, the BC Boys turned to Manello, who was kind of like this Orson Welles type character. He could, he could actually imitate Welles very well, but <laughs> he also would like do the, do the voice. But, you know, he kind of knew everything about film. And they were like, we want you to do it. And Manello was, he, he was all that, but he was also a bit nervous too. He, and he never directed um, a video or anything else really like that. I had directed films. Uh, I had just finished film school. I had directed all these films and I, I was unafraid. And more than that, I really wanted to get into doing this kind of thing. So I, I was working on Tough and Leather and I was like, I'll do it. You know, and Manello always said jokingly, maybe semi jokingly for years that um, he, he wanted me aboard as co-director because this way, if it, if it went sideways, he could blame, blame it on me. me. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. And, uh, and we just we just latched on, and and there was uh, you know I always point out there was a day that that we had to figure out what the video was going to be. We knew the budget was going to be small, and so we only could shoot it in one location. Well, what's that location going to be, and what are they going to do? And so they the there was a day that about probably a week before we shot, when we had to figure out what we were going to shoot, that we went down to the beast to Mike D's apartment uh, off Hudson street. And it was the three beastie boys, myself and Rick Manello. And we sat and we laid out what the idea would be for the script. And then Manello and I went back to his place and like just sat and wrote everything. So that's how small the group it was. It wasn't a lot of record people. It wasn't anything. It was just us figuring out what we were going to do. And then basically asking all our friends to come down and help. And that's why you, you, you see the yeah. people you do in the, you know, the guys from Murphy's law, mm. um, Half of the people from Def Jam came, who were working at that time came down. Uh, cool. No money, of course, to pay actors. You know, we were the actors, and and uh, yeah. the 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 parents who say that to to the, to the two kids um, that that was Rick's parents, Rick Manello's parents, who were actually way too old to be the parents of those kids. They're actually more like grandparents, but that <laughs> even made it more like funny and like weird, you know. And uh, and it was just you know it was like a, one of those great fly by the seat of your pants things where we just filmed it over the course of two days on, on Thanksgiving uh, weekend in 1986. And two weeks later or so it's up and running on MTV and it, it wow. you know, it was off it goes, you know, the, I think it, it showed the world who the beastie boys are. The song, the song is great. We know the song is great. And then you get to see these guys and really, you know, sink your teeth in. Well, there was just, yeah, there was so much personality in the video. I mean, there were, I don't recall anything like that before, you know, the humor of it. And especially just it resonating big time with me as a kid. So, so get us from the success of that, which I'm guessing opened some doors for you. Um, yep. Get us from that to 1990. How does a guy like you get the call to do this project for Metallica? Yeah. So I, I was working around and yeah, I mean, it opened some doors, but it's basically, you're still gigging around. It was, it, you know, it was a, it was a hit video, but you know, there's, there's a bunch of directors that had hit videos of some kind or another, and that that's good. Now you're, you know, you're sort of in the, in the, 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 the stream with everybody and you're, you're, you're vying for, you know, to get your, to make some videos, you know, so I'm doing directing various music videos, mostly heavy metal stuff. And I, I kind of followed Rick out to California when he went there and he's doing deaf American. And, uh, now he's working with guys like Danzig and, um, the four horsemen and uh, Wolf Spain and Trouble and a lot of the, these great bands that he produced. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so kind of like my name's kind of known. And I got with a production company that was one of the biggest doing music videos, which is a, a company called Propaganda Films. Um, they were one of the biggest that represented directors that produced music videos. So 
I was the little guy in a stable that was doing videos for like, you know, the big Madonna videos, the big Def Leppard videos, the big, you know, there was some really huge, like million dollar stuff going on. I was not part of that. I was the little guy. And um, probably a guy like David Fincher, who's like a major director now, Michael Bay, major directors. They were, they were big directors then of music videos mm. and commercials. So I'm there and my, um, uh, my my manager at the time was, you know, I mean, as was her job, she was tight with like management companies of, of various, you know, metal acts and everything. And I get a call one day that, you know, I had not met Metallica at this point. Of course, I knew who they were. And of course, like I was, you know, I was, you know, I, I thought they were, they were, they were terrific. I had not even seen them play live yet though. Um, but anybody who like that, you know, that kind of music, I mean, you're aware of this, this band that just, with no radio airplay, they had just just done it themselves. That was mm -hmm. that was about then, and they had this incredible fan base and everything. And so I get a call. Metallica might want to film something uh, of the making of their new album. Are you interested? And I was like, Yeah, sure, I'm interested. You know, let, let me. You know, it, like anything, it comes down to a meeting. I mean, everything's a meeting because you got to see if you're if you're on the same wavelength. Uh -huh. Now. To that time, there wasn't really a lot to go on. Not a lot of people filmed themselves in the studio. So it was even odder that this band who didn't really film anything would be interested in this at all. But they were. And I think that I think Metallica had a sense that whatever they did next was was going to be something special. They just had a, a sense of it. They they had brought on for the first time like a producer of the level of Bob Rock. And I think they just had a sense of of something, but it was by no means uh, a slam dunk that this was going to happen. So I, I, they fly me out to the coast and uh, to the West coast that is. And I, I, I'm driven to the, the studio, which in this case is one-on-one -on -one recording studio. Right. Nothing major is happening at that moment. They're getting drum sounds, which uh, if anybody's worked in the studio, that's like watching paint dry. Boring, I mean, they, yeah. they, they, they <laughs> whack a, a drum and, and the, the, the technicians listen to it and then they whack the drum again and hours go by of them trying to get the right sound for the snare and then for the, 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 the kick and every other thing um, and how to mic it right. So this is all going on. I, I meet with Lars and, and I, I'm very, I'm led to understand that nothing by, this is by no means certain that I've got to convince them to, to try to do something like this. And I'm like, now how the hell do you convince Lars to do anything or James to do anything? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, they're not like, these guys are not convinced of anything. Were there other people sort of audition? It's kind of an audition, right? Were there other people in the yeah. hat buying for the gig? I get the idea that there wasn't. I was. I was certainly. No, no other names, were, you know, were, were came up. Right. It was. It was such a. I think it was such a a one off idea. Like, uh, we'll see if this works, and we're not even sure if we want to do it. That I, I always thought about that. That they meet with five other directors. I know they didn't. I mean, in, in hindsight, I know they didn't. But even at the time, I got the feeling that this was really precarious not necessarily going to happen and they didn't know at the time that it would be you would be following them on tour also i think they, they just thought oh to document god. some of the album right oh my god no it was it, yeah. i didn't know if i'd follow them even for one day it yeah. was like and this was this right. the story goes that like i'm in there i'm meeting with, with lars and he's very friendly and nice and like we kind of run down the people that we know in common and everything and rick rubin by the way being one of them and rick ultimately put in a good word for me which was very kind mm, of him awesome awesome um, yeah yeah, I mean the management company called to check up on me and and got you know got got good marks from Ruben at that at that point. That was that was that was very kind of him. Um, I meet with Lars. Lars is very friendly and gregarious. Is exactly the way he is, and 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 he's like um, and he's very knowledgeable about film. And so he's asking yeah. me technical questions. What would you film it on? You know, how would you do it? And I wanted to film it on film, which is more expensive. Video at that time wasn't even much up to HD. It was like you know kind of. It would have been scratchy and it wouldn't have held up well. And I was kind of going for that classic feel. Again, the thing I I loved was Woodstock, you know, shot on film, right. beautiful. You know, years later, it still holds up. And I said this to him, that's all good. And I, I think, oh, this is going pretty well. This is actually kind of great. You know, this guy's a cool guy and he's like funny. And we're, we know some people in common. It's funny. Boom. Hetfield walks in. The mighty Hetfield. <laughs> Different vibe, huh? Hallways. Yeah. Wearing a, a, a ten gallon hat, <laughs> I swear to God, he strides in like it. it, it the thing it kind of hit me as is kind of like Clint Eastwood in you know in Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. 
swaggering, confident, you know, plops himself down in this chair and he's like, like staring at me. The only thing missing was like the little cigarette or something, you know what I mean? Which he doesn't smoke, of course, but it was like, you know, everything, the six gun would have been right, right at, at home on, on his uh, hip. So, and he's like, you know, everything is kind of like a grunt. He's like, so what you, you want to come film us? You know, <laughs> he's like, and you want to, you want to put lights in here? You know, he's sneering at everything. He's not having it. Now I, I've come to figure out later that a bit of this is a test, Sure, but he doesn't know me. You know what I mean? And he doesn't care about the people that I know that he knows. He's, he's like, he's looking me up and down because he understands quite clearly that if I'm going to be there, he's got to live with me. And then, and the real thing is, does he want to live with anybody? You know, like who's right. going to be in his world. And he's very guarded about that then and now as he, as he must be, you know? And, and so I realized all of a sudden I was getting good copped and bad copped, you know? And I mean, it was like, they were like toying with me, these two guys. And so I'm answering questions as quick as they can fire them, but I realize it's not certain at all. And in the end, James was concerned as he, as he had to be about the vibe in the studio for shooting. L Lars was too, but I think Lars figured he could, he could handle it. And he was kind of, an, you know, interested in having the camera there to document. James was more interested in like, is this camera going to upset the vibe of what we've got to do here? The very important yeah. work of what we've got to do. And I think he was coming down on the side of like, if it's going to be a distraction, don't do it. Right. You know? And so he was kind of looking at J Lars and Lars is looking at him. And I realized, you know, right there is how, how the band has always worked. It still works that way. And, and he just was like, well, I don't know, man. I don't. I don't think this is so great having lights and having a camera in there. And I needed somebody else because if you're going to do film, you need to have somebody roll sound separately because um, that's that's what the clap slate's about. You sync it up later. Mm -hmm. And James is like, I don't know. And at the last minute, I threw this hail mary pass, which I don't know why because it didn't occur to me until that very last second. I could I could feel I was getting like the 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 bums rush as they say where it was like Lars was like well we'll see we'll think about it which kind of meant like that's a nice way of saying like thanks for coming down yeah and I just said hey look I'm here I'm in California why don't you let me film something I said if you like what I do great you know I said and if you don't then you'll never hear from me again it'll be fine you know and they looked at each other and I, James gave this shrug that kind of said if this is what it'll take to get rid of this idiot then <laughs> then yeah and he kind of shrugged and walked out and. And Lars was kind of like, all right, you know, we're, we're working tomorrow. Like, come back tomorrow. So I remember going out to my my manager who was waiting in the lounge and saying, she was like, you know, is it a go? Are we good? And I go, well, we're, we're not anything yet. I said, I need a camera and I need some rolls of film for tomorrow. And she was like, all right. And that was, you know, on the way back, she like got that. I showed up the next day. As I recall, Lars was the only one there. And I have that roll of film to, to show. And I just kind of did this like study of like, how they were working and and the one shot it's funny that the one thing that i found interesting about lars you know was he does that thing where he tapes his fingers before he goes out and drums and i said oh, let me let me get some close-ups of that let me film that and ultimately some of that shot there's one shot i think in in the nothing else matters music video where i use that shot from that first test roll wow so yeah otherwise it was just it was nothing else to film it was technicians hooking up microphones and stuff it was, it was, it was pretty boring so I left them. I, I I left California. I went back to New York. I, I the film was sent for processing. It was sent as a, it was transferred to video, sent to Lars and maybe James. I don't know if James ever looked at it, but I know Lars did. And I kind of gave it up for lost. I was like, well, I took my best shot. I, I, I that's really the thing. I never heard of anybody else going in there, so I don't think it was ever anybody else was up for it. And two weeks later, I get this phone call. It was like, well, they want you to go for it, but. Um, come back out and we'll see how it goes. That was the whole thing was, we'll see how it goes. So I'm there and I start to film. You're still seeing how it goes. It's still <laughs> 30 years exactly. later. It's like a callback in an, in, a, in an audition, you know, it's like, okay, that looked pretty good. Uh, let's bring him back in a few weeks and see if he could, you know, kind of continue to produce that kind of quality. It also reminds me, Adam, of, of what would happen 10, 12 years later. Same thing with Joe Berlinger, where he's making a film. They go through, they're going through some different shit. And then he had to sort of take a Hail Mary and show them some footage and prove to them that it was going to be cool too, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, it always reminds me of the thing Kirk says, I'm sure you guys know, which was he, he's never actually been told he's been, he's in the band, you know, he, he <laughs> yeah. came out, he, he, you know, he was there, he replaced Mustaine and he, um, 
And he just sort of started, they, they just kind of booked gigs. He's playing the gigs yeah. and he's like kind of recording Kill 'em All. But he, he said in many interviews, he's like, they never actually told me I'm in the band. So he still, he still might go play for Exodus someday if it doesn't work out. He's still filling in right now. Yeah. But I kind of knew when they started hazing me that I said, oh, that's probably a good sign. They started, yeah. you know, cursing at me, giving me the finger, throwing stuff at me, um, you know, kind of, kind of, and, and, you know, it was pretty pretty easy. I, I have to say, the meeting meeting. Um, I'm always grateful. Jason was was as kind as he could be when he he just you know. Of course, he was like you know he, he didn't know what was going on. He's like you know what are you here for? And I said I'm here to film, and he's like oh he goes well I'm Jason. Welcome, you know. And it was very gentlemanly. It was very nice. That's cool. And Kirk was also Kirk. We knew people in common, and we sort of had this thing about monster movies that we liked and everything. So he was like like a little guarded, but then he he realized like like we're kind of you know kind of on this on a certain level together and he was very cool how did bob rock feel about it did he have anything to say yeah, nothing good i could tell you that he, <laughs> he, uh, i mean imagine bob rock i mean he's got a handful to deal with already you know what i mean he's got yeah. like do this thing he was clearly not consulted like hey bob we we're thinking about having this guy coming in and film what do you think about that because he would have said no and it's you know he, he was hired to make a great record and he did um boy the looks i got from him and and the curses and stuff, and you know, when I would turn my lights on, and the groans, and the and the engineer Randy Staub, I mean, they were not pleased. But you know, I mean, on my on me, it was like I got to make myself a fly on the wall. I cannot right. intrude on this process, and I don't want to affect it. So some of that was, as I always say, always say, you have to know when to turn the camera on. You also have to know when to turn the camera off. If, if I got a couple of takes of something, it's also expensive. Film was expensive, so. I, I would like kind of get it and then turn the light off, let them get what they get on with what they had to do. And that was particularly something during vocals. There's something very intimate about a vocal, yeah. about trying to capture the right vocal. And, you know, I mean, here I am, I'm in the actual same space as Hetfield while he's, while he's doing these very emotive, you know, very emotional vo vocals and kind of, as we know by this record, taking his voice to a new place, right? He was kind of exploring yeah. something that was different. As Bob Rock says, in, in, it's in the film someplace, like does, does James Hetfield have to be angry all the time? Can there be like other levels of, 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 and James wanted to explore that too. So you have to be sensitive to that. And me as a filmmaker, I had to be sensitive and, and not, um, you know, not kind of, get in the way of that and it, and look there's times i did kind of get in the way but you know you you hope you built up a little bit of a uh, cred and they could you know kind of tell you to f off and get out of there and, and and you do and you listen and were you watching um were you watching dailies like how or did you have a sense as a director of like i i got him singing you know the lead vocal to unforgiven and it was a great moment and i know we got that or were, what was the process like if you sort of logging the material you were getting yeah that's a good point that's a very good point dailies were were you know it's very expensive so what they would do is gather up a lot of stuff before they would then arrange so they process the film immediately but then gather it up and then do a telecine uh which is the transfer process tel telecine um every maybe month or so uh because they could they could then get it on off time that was less expensive again a lot being done you know it was, it was expensive anyway to do all this process so we tried to minimize so I would see stuff actually much less frequently. Um, and I just had to use my good sense and know if mm. I got something, as I said, knowing when, when to not film also and to go hide in the corner or just get out of the way. And you, you pretty much learn a rhythm to it. The rhythm is something like this. They do something in the recording studio. They do it a few times and then they go back into the, into the um, control room and they talk about what they just did. If I got them doing something a few times, unless they were doing something else, it's very repetitive. So mm -hmm. what I'm really now interested in is what they think or feel about that. And so I would then go into the into the control room and wait, and they would come in and be like, listen back. And the listening back would be like, okay, cool. And then I wanted to be ready when they were when they were filming it, you know, when they were like <laughs> I would be filming when they were discussing what went down. This has to be more like this or more like that. That was interesting. I'm thinking about a, a particular scene where there's a little bit of icy tension between Lars and James. Yeah. Where Lars is wanting James to maybe sing a vocal so he can have a guide, and James's voice is a little out. And James is saying, "Well, if you want, if you want vocals on it, then go sing it." Were there moments like that where you're filming where you're like, were there ground rules or anything about like, hey, don't put that in the film? 
that's band shit. It's not even as juicy as it looks. It's just band crap. Or were they just pre- once they committed to you being there? Were they? It seems like they might must have been pretty cool about it, right? Yeah, they they um, they have always been very cool about it, um, and they they uh, you know I'm grateful they trusted me, but they also trusted me in the sense that that then as now nothing ever gets out. It's theirs. They own it. I don't own anything. They mm-hmm. own this material, and I would never breach that confidence. And so. It's like they. I wanted them to feel free to to express what they what they had to do, and and then for me to you know just I think they know that we'll you know we'll see what happens in the editing process. They ultimately have final say over what right. it is, it's like over the music. So so they were trusting in me, and of course the trust has grown over over the years. I mean now it's it's at you know at a level of just. You know, they they truly trust me to look out for their best interests on stuff. If I saw something that was that was just terrible, I'd point it out, and and but it would never make it to you know into something. But I don't know what terrible would exactly mean. But I, I just want you know, I just would would watch out for them. So yeah, there was that moment. Um, you know, look in any creative process, there's there's tension because you're trying to get it right, and these are these are you know great musicians. They're meticulous. Um, we can certainly listen to the final product and see how great it really is. And, and so Bob Rock, to his great credit, also had them for the first time, the band recording together, or at least the drum tracks, but in a circle together, looking at each other. And I think that mm-hmm. really lends a lot to the um, power of that music. Mm-hmm. So in that process, that was for, you know, whatever it was, a month or two of, of them working together. It was really just to get the drums down. Everything else was discarded, you know, and, and not used till you know, re-recorded later, those guitar parts. But um, James James's voice was shot that night, you know, and so sometimes there's some tension between, between the guys. Lars wanted to hear how the vocal worked and how his drum pattern was. And, you know, part of the great thing about these guys is they have a great sense of humor. So there's kind of an as much as there's tension, there's also an edge to that tension that's got humor in it. And, you know, it's what we see with, you know, James, I think told him, uh, if you want to hear it sung, go sing it, you know, and yeah. with mm-hmm. a lot of, you know, acid in his voice. James is really funny yeah. and, uh, back and forth. Look, part of that tension resulted in Lars. I mean, those drum patterns, it, it's, it's very progressive. It's very complicated. It's not just, you know, a, a simple thing he's trying to do. And, there was one occasion when I, I caught Lars trying to get some drum part right, and he and he got mad, and he like drove the the uh, drumstick into the yeah. snare. And I I've heard that that happens a lot of times. Or it happens in other studio situations, not with just with yep. Metallica. Thing <laughs> the, the fans get frustrated. We've all heard of guys throwing down guitars. I'm not talking about Pete Townsend style. I'm talking just just pissed and throwing down your guitar, stabbing a drum head, whatever. Um, obviously it's, it's with certain bands, it's gotten further where it's gotten into fist fights and stuff. You know, if you talk about like bands like Oasis and stuff, you know, yeah. and, and there's this creative tension there, you know, and, uh, I'm just glad I got some of that on film. Like, like I was I had there and rolling that minute when Lars, you know, stabbed the drum head, but it, it it's genuine. You're trying to get it right. And you know, it, it's great. And if I could just say one more thing about it, which was here I was, I had no idea what the songs were. I didn't know anything. I just knew what I had to cover. Can you imagine like starting to hear like Enter Sandman? I was going to ask you that. I was, what was your sense of like, I mean, you're just getting, you're hearing, you're hearing sad, but true Enter Sandman, Unforgiven, nothing else matters for, before anyone. Right. What was that like for you? It, it was, it was stunning because I mean, I like the music, but I love that music and, and, and especially like, you know, I know people have their different take on, on it. I, I loved because I had grown up, I'm from, I'm, I'm, old, I'm the same age as the guys in Metallica. So I'd grown up, I hadn't grown up on Metallica. I'd grown up on classic rock. And there was sort of enough of a turn toward like, you know, it's not Led Zeppelin, but you know what I mean. It's like, like ACDC. Rock, like an ACDC. And, in, in, yeah. you know, it, it just has enough of that, that thing that I was like, man, this is so great. When, when I, when I heard these songs, I was like, holy cow. I was like, it's, it's different enough from Injustice for All. I liked Injustice for All, but it didn't have like a million different parts to it and a million different changes. It just sort of did what it had to do and then moved on. And then you get the next song. And 
And I, you know, something like the Unforgiven is almost like a classic rock song. I mean, it's just it it builds to this crescendo, mm -hmm. and nothing else matters. Same type of, you know, it's just it's just a new version of it. And I thought it was amazing. I was blown away. I was particularly amazed when we would go back into the, you know, in the drum room, you're hearing those drums banging away. That's really loud. I mean, all you're hearing, and and the amps are someplace else. They're isolated. So. I sort of had a sense of it, but I was like, I was more like concentrating, get my footage. But when we went into the control room and Bob and Randy would like bring it up and they would do like just a, a an on the fly mix. So you're hearing it now with like a guitar part and a, and a bit of a solo and everything. Oh my God. Even a rough vocal from Hetfield. It's like, oh my God, the Unforgiven. I mean, epic. Yeah. And, and, and that's before it even has like the, 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 the horn on it and the snare and all those little sounds that they added later on right. in Vancouver. That was just an epic song. And so, yeah, I, I was, I, I was blown away and I was like, wow, we're working on something that's really important here. Like they were really smart to, to, to feel that, that something was going on here that they were going to want to cover, you know? The Vancouver sessions seem really fun to me because they, they were just putting a bunch of color, yeah. getting out of California, overdubs, Lars with his percussion day. Mm -hmm. So you were up there for all of it, right? All of it, yeah. So we, we're going to have a lot of questions about, about this documentary later. So I want to move on into, so at some point, you got the gig and you're cool, even if they never said it. But when does it turn into Black Album is a monster if it's coming out and we're going to go on tour forever Right. And you're coming with us to document it. When it, when did that become a reality? Okay, so um, yeah, it was it was um, you know at some point I'm just I'm adopted. I'm part of the woodwork. You know what I mean? Just like the engineers and everything else. So I'm making the thing. It went on forever. To give you an idea, when I was hired on, in it was like November. I, I auditioned or whatever in October, and it was November of 1990. I was told by everybody, we'll be done with this in, in February, and then we'll be going to mixes. Okay, so I'll be living on the West Coast for you know four months or something like that. Fine. In <laughs> February, I think we were finishing the last drum track, and and we're like, you know, start doing overdubs, starting to do guitar overdubs, vocal overdubs hadn't happened yet, um, Kirk solos hadn't happened yet. So that's how this was going on, you know. Everything with Metallica being bigger and long and 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 bigger, and that and uh, just as a note, the 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 week in Vancouver was because it was going on so long. They need they were getting crazy. They needed an escape. It was like kind of let's get ourselves out of Bob Rock again, being very smart about that, saying let's get out of here for a week and go there and we'll do all this stuff there. Okay, so as we're coming around, the you know the single for for. Enter Sandman is released in summer of um, 1991, and it's a monster. It's great. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact date it came out. Why I'm thinking sometime in like June, July, whatever. I know that the album dropped in August, I think 12th of 1991, um, and it. I mean, it's just building toward this monster. This the the the, the videos of a, a monster for for. Um, Enter Sandman. Everything is big. It's signaling big things, and you know promoters are booking. Um, they have some some gigs set for a, a tour in the fall, and it's just it's just huge. I mean, it's just a, a, a huge thing. It's like they can tell when a band is like moving up, not just one level, but like you know really going up a bunch of levels. And of course, Q Prime had seen this before because they had they had shepherded um, Def Leppard up this same kind of territory where, you know, suddenly they, you know, um, pyromania explodes, goes big. And then what's hysteria do even bigger, right, yeah. you know? So yeah. it's like, it's like they're in the right lane to do this now. And, and everything is kind of moving forward. And at some point it was like, I mean, something happened before that, which was before I was brought on tour we had to, I heard you guys talking about this on another podcast, but there was, there was no opening act for the black album tour. Um, the opening act there was a video that you made, right? I made the video for it. They, they, yeah, they just right. they didn't have an opening act. They knew they were going to play two and a half hours every night, which is, you know, stunning. I mean, it's just amazing. And I think they, they realized that a lot of people coming to the shows had seen the band on MTV or, or, you know, were newer fans, maybe a fan of from Injustice for All onward, and, you know, or maybe there's the Black Album onward. And they, you know, wanted to acquaint them with like, 
who and what the band was about. So they, they said to me, look, we want you to create a, a film about 15 minutes long that gives people, you know, kind of here's some of our history and where we come from and what, you know, the other albums. And that, cause obviously on the tour, they were going to be playing a lot of material from other albums and kind of gives people a history if they don't really know us that well. And so I created that. And then at the end of the video, so the video would run, they would, they would have the video run and at the end of the, I think sometime during the 15 minutes, if I remember right, there was a break in it. Lars would come on and he would be live from the dressing room. And he would like mm-hmm. say, you know, what's up, you know, Cleveland, you know, what's going on? And there'd be a lot of shrieking and everything like that. And he'd be like, we're going to be out very soon and all that stuff. And then they would go back and finish up with a segment about the making of the black album. So that was the first time I actually got to cut my footage, the footage that I had been shooting for the, the year before that. And, um, and I cut like a little thing about the making of, of enter Sandman and some of the other stuff from the studio, a couple things. Um, most famously, um, Kip Winger, the darts on Kip Winger. <laughs> and, uh, Kip. <laughs> that was in there. Cause it was just like this funny moment from the studio. I got nothing against Kip Winger. And don't, you know, it's like, I didn't do it, but it was just, and, and by the way, there was always somebody up on the dartboard the day I filmed it, it happened to be him, but you know, it could have been anybody. Did you hear the Lars interview uh, on the, his recent interview with Stern? He mentions that scene that you, that you shot. Really? No, I, I didn't he, hear that. No, what's he saying? Well, he's like, he's like, oh, I've been asked about, you know, the, the Kip Winger dartboard has haunted me for decades now. Cause you know, they got older, they mellowed out. Now they're friends with all these people that they, you know, were making fun of. And anyway, it's funny that he mentions that your film, you know, even, even just a few months ago. Yeah. I've, I've, you know, I, I don't know Kip. I never met him. I, I don't think maybe be mad at me, but I know he said uh, in various interviews that he thinks that didn't do his career any good. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, maybe, maybe uh, <laughs> I think that nineties didn't do any of those guys. Career well, any good. Didn't throw a lot of people it, but, but it, you know, it changed. I mean, music changes and that's what it does. Look, any, yeah. anyway, everybody's out there playing and they can, they all have their, 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 you know, place. And, and you know, people want to hear them. Great. I love it. Was the live aspect of it easier or is it more challenging or less challenging than the studio part? It's challenging in a way of, you know, you're moving and stuff. I mean, and, and it, and that part of it, you know, I learned to, change camera roles in a, in the back of vans and stuff. I mean, on the move and then run out with cameras. There's a challenge to that. It's way more interesting though. And fun, you know, it's crazy. And, um, they, they just, you know, it was the thing that kept going. Lars is really the one who was like, he, he realized the moment and was like, something special is happening. You know, obviously the, the records are hit and we want to, continue documenting this and see and and kind of show people I there was still you know at, at that time I didn't know what it was ever going to be nobody knew what it was going to be but Lars is the one who realized look we have this footage of the of the studio let's start using it so obviously some of it made its way into the uh opening opening you know thing before they they played hope the opening video and then again Lars asked me they they were two video two singles in I mean they'd released Enter Sandman they released um, a concept video for uh, The Unforgiven Matt Mahern did, did that one um, Wayne mm-hmm. Isham did, did Enter Sandman great videos you know very iconic mm-hmm. videos and then they were faced with an, another thing they, the next single was going to be uh, Nothing Else Matters and so they what the specific ask what they wanted was to see if the footage would work because what they wanted to do was get away from you know they knew if they did a concept video number one it's very expensive I'll, I'll i'll say that these are these are all expensive videos but number two it was like they wanted to get away from it being like too much of a love song kind of thing like with too much imagery and stuff mm-hmm. and they felt that like by just using the footage of them creating the song in the studio that might be a way to to um kind of approach the lyrical content in a little different way and and not you know it is what what it is this song i mean it, it's certainly some sort of a love song without saying the word love it's certainly uh, so i kind of took it as making it about the camaraderie between them and that's what i endeavored to show in the video and um I, I, i'm so happy there was a day that that lars called up and left a, a, a voicemail for me on an answering machine back in the day and he was like whoa you did it you know he had seen the video mm. The, the awesome. rough tape, of it. and it was really kind of great. It was like so, one of these 
moments that was fun when you had put together the nothing else matters video and that got released at that point in time was there was there talk yet to take all that other footage and make it into an actual documentary yet i i would say yes it sounds like by the by the beginning of 1992 is 1991 um they're now on the tour and it is like see the thing about the tour is when you have a hit album that that where it's you know song after song is coming off the album and it's a hit after after that it was um wherever i may roam um and it just kept going the you know what happens is you keep it's not just that you keep booking dates is that promoters keep extending dates to you so you can keep booking up the world you can go around the world again and again and so mm -hmm. it's you know you have a success you have a hit people want to see you they want to hear you play so they started you know they started doing this now what happened in 1992 was yeah there started to be a discussion i remember very early in 1992 um being on the phone with with management and being told like okay we have to start finding an edit room we have to start putting this out and i think it's because they 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 had an idea that they wanted some product on the shelves for um for the end of 92 which is christmas season of 92 they wanted another piece of product out there which would be something from this film and let's face it they have every right to want to um you know recoup their investment which they've now extended for uh, for over a year and a half of, of money making these films and are you i mean without without getting any details of course but like are you on a are you on some sort of salary or retainer how, how are you squared away while you're go gone from your home for months at a time and year at a time i was just on a um as i recall um i i, I was not on retainer but i was on i i would get paid as I worked, you know, and, and I was working steadily. So it was almost like I, I as I recall, I had a day rate and okay. I, I would just, any day that I worked, I got my day rate, almost like, like one of the road crew or something. If they're working, they're working that day. Even if it's a prep day, you, you're working, you get your day rate. I was just, you know, at a certain point, you're just working every day for these guys, you know, and it was great. You know, it's just that that's how that's how it was. You know, you're just kind of going and going. Did you have certain moments of the tour that you would go out for, like Day on the Green or MTV yeah. Movie Award or Music Awards, blah, blah, blah? Or were you kind of just out there for the whole long haul? It's too expensive for me to be on for the whole long haul because it's, mm -hmm. it's not just me. It's like, I mean, even if you're paying my salary, it doesn't matter. It's like, you know, I need some, there, there, there might be some things I need. But more importantly, if you it, it's generating all that film. Film is expensive, and so it was me and and uh, my my uh, my you know my my friend and cohort Vin, Vinnie Giordano. Vincent Giordano was actually the cousin of Rick Manello, my my, co my other co-director, oh, wow. and a fellow filmmaker. And uh, and we were we were the guys on the on the road. And but you know there's a price tag to that. Every single day has a price, and then the film and everything like that. So it's expensive. So again, you know I think wisely uh, the band like kind of picked and chose what they felt would be um, indicative of what's going on. So in February and March of 1992, we went out on the road and filmed like a whole bunch of dates. And that's a lot of what makes up um, uh, this, the second part of Year and a Half of Life. Um, it, was just, it, it was just, you know, a road show. That was when I have the stuff of filming them on like the plane, you know, and, and they were traveling around on the prop plane with the, uh, with the snake logo on the tail. Yeah. And, um, that's awesome. Yeah, it's great. And that's when I filmed like, you know, kind of all that craziness that was going on, which was, you know, it was a real good indication of what, what was going on at the time. And then they took me over, which was one, one of my favorite filmmaking experiences of all time was, was when we went to England, uh, on this special one-off to film the Freddie Mercury, um, AIDS awareness concert. Yeah. Uh, un unfortunately, Freddie had passed the year before, and uh, you know, near and dear to so many people in, in the in the business, uh, in the in the rock business and the whole and music world, and um, so it was a real big moment for Metallica. They were they were I mean, of course they're well known, of course we know them, but for them to be on the world stage like that, that concert at Wembley was was you know simulcast to the world, but it's sort of the way it was like the biggest thing after um, Live Aid, which had been like six or seven years before. You know, for Metallica to have three songs up there and and solo, you know, and be one of the they were the first band out, but I mean, to have that important placement, and then of course James getting up there and doing a song with the Queen guys. I mean, that's like, you know, I mean, Elton John's there, David Bowie's there, you know. I mean, it's like Robert Plant. I mean, it's you know, it's the top shelf of of rock, mm -hmm. and it was amazing. You know, Lars kind of talks about that in the film and everything. Um, 
what it meant for them to, to be there. Um, and, and then of course, one of my favorite film moments of all time, which was the meeting between, uh, Metallica and, uh, Spinal Spinal Tap. Oh man, that was such a good part of that movie. <laughs> when I had finally gotten, gotten hip to Christopher Guest movies and Spinal Tap and waiting for Guffman and stuff, and then rewatching uh, a year and a half, I'm just seeing that part where they're, they're confronting them on the black album cover. It's just pr- priceless. I'm so glad you caught that, man. But see that that your film was my introduction to Spinal Tap oh, wow. because I didn't even I hadn't even seen that film. Wow! So that was the first time I saw. The, so when I finally did see Spinal Tap, I was like, "Oh, those are the guys from the Metallica documentary." That's cool. Well, those guys were, you know, my my producer Jack Ulick set that up. I mean, they were they were near they were uh, next dressing room over. And it was like gonna happen. I just had to make sure I could have my cameras on it, and we we cleared it with their their you know people and stuff. And then, um, yeah, it was it was it was you know I, Lars was busy like working um, uh, business stuff. Like if he wasn't on stage doing stuff, actually the business he was working, as it turns out, turned out to be the Guns Metallica tour, which was going to be announced mm-hmm. the following month, and then the tour was going to start two months later. So uh-huh. Lars like had his hands full doing you know business and stuff, and. I don't know. Jason disappeared, and I just remember uh, James and Kirk being up for the game. You know what I mean? Meeting the uh, Spinal mm-hmm. Tap guys, and of course, for me, it's one of my favorite film moments of all. Yeah, just such a such a laugh, and and um, yeah, nice nice time. So that was that was really special. Came back. I was already editing in edit mode for year and a half in the life. Now now I'm I'm editing everything the the, the studio parts, and as we're filming the tour parts i'm editing that too and we go down the line and and um the next time i was out with them was the the pre you know the pre-production and then the the on the road with the um uh the the famous guns metallica tour which was just you know kind of the height of rock and roll craziness <laughs> that it could ever yeah. be. how much of that could you i mean uh... We're not prudes at all. We we toured forever, Ethan and I. Yeah. I mean, how much of that could you not film? I mean, I'm just trying to imagine. Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you I'm, I'm you got to be careful. I'm sure with some of that stuff. Yeah, you do. I mean, it, it's it's like I, I mean, I think I put in the film like again. I try to with my film like give an indication of of what's going on to the extent possible. It's actually you know I mean there's some stuff that you know. Um, in the film that's there that's pretty raw you know about what all was mm-hmm. going on on a, on, a, on, a, on rock and it, i don't think it surprises anybody by the way it's rock and yeah. roll and it's yeah. like you know we all know it. it's it's sex drugs and rock and roll and what's in the film is in the film um you know i was always careful not to you know kind of uh, belittle people and stuff like that i, I felt right. if i was pointing a camera at somebody and and they were aware of it and and understood what what's involved and uh, you know then that was okay. But I have to say, I didn't film things that I then had to like, um, you know, burn that roll of film or something like that. I, 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 <laughs> right. I probably, as I told you, it was, it was being smart, knowing when to turn the film, the camera off and probably, and you wouldn't yeah. have, yeah. And you wouldn't have been there if you weren't capable of that kind of discretion. Right. That stuff's all b- b- baked into the cake. The two scenes I want to talk about that we have to talk about before we move on. Number one is the Jason and the fucking sandwiches scene. Okay. which everyone loves <laughs> he's doing what i've done on tour forever but i did it because i was poor right. on tour he's he's a millionaire so he's he's taking catering back to his hotel so he doesn't have to buy food at the hotel right okay so you want, I'll, I'll do that one first so it's like that was typical of what would have happened on on any night jason was st- you know then and i don't know maybe it went on for his whole life in the band he i mean he's a nice guy i, I really love jason and he, um, I don't see him much. I've, I've run into him over the years, but I, I, I'm going to say this just, and then I'll, I'll get the story. I have so much respect for him because if you see what that guy put out on stage every single night, any band would be more than happy to have a player like that. Who was, I mean, yeah. 150% dedicated every single night, just a, just great and great for the fans and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you know, he always took the bulk of the crap that was going on. That said, everybody gets a wind up now and again. It's a, called a wind up, and everybody got one, and you know, myself included. So you had to roll with it. But I, you know, I from what I understand, even before I was in the in the picture, um, you know, it was always beat on Jason. You know, a, a lot. You know, did James ever get it? Did, did anyone ever do anything to James? They would do. 
maybe certain, not in the same way as Jason. Nobody got like that, but Jim, <laughs> I mean, they, you know, I mean, they, you know, make poke fun at him and, you know, joke, make some jokes about him. Not, you know, everybody could get joked on or get like being told something in dead, dead seriousness that turns out later to be a joke, that kind of thing. Could happen anybody. That's, that's a wind up. The British crew always called it a wind up and they would look to wind mm. somebody up. In the case of Jason, he he seemed to get dumped on a little little more than everybody else. And that night, I I was fil- I I just remember filming him. I was just filming the catering afterward. I mean, I don't I didn't do that because I was going for him. It was just like it was after the show, and you know, I film a little bit because maybe they would talk about what the show was like, which they did sometimes. You know, oh that was good, or I screwed up on this song or whatever. You know, they were all there. Look, they would stay in like some good hotels. Room service is expensive. They would get a per diem. I know it because of myself. And I, you don't want to blow the money. And here's all this good food that was there that the second they leave, either the crew would, would tear it apart or would get thrown out. So I think mm-hmm. Jason was like, uh, you know, being frugal. He's, he's a, uh, you know, a, a thrifty Midwesterner. And I think he just was feeling like he didn't want to throw away money. Like there's food here, and then he would go back to the hotel and order something that would cost five times as much, you know, because right, it's yeah. delivered. And I don't think he was down for it. So they gave him, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a bunch of crap about it. And and I think he rolled with it pretty well, you know. I mean, he just he just dealt with it. But yeah, it's it was stuff like that could happen. You know, I still do that on the road. I mean, not currently, obviously, with COVID, but. I mean, the last time I was on the road was in February. And I mean, I remember the last show I did in February, I took a bunch of food back to the hotel, not only for that night after the show, but to take on my flight home the next day too. I'm like, I don't want to spend money at the airport. Right. It's funny to think about us being kids learning that from Jason all those years ago. Yeah. I know. Okay. So the last thing we have to talk about, I mean, we just have to talk about this. Uh, our listeners of our show will, will crucify us if we don't. And you and I have emailed about it, Adam, but we got to talk about Rome guy. You call him fuzz top. Yeah. But we call him Rome guy. And I don't know how it happened. I mean, we've done a couple of episodes on your film where we sort of talked about it. We need to do some updated ones where we actually watch it with commentary. But <clears throat> this guy just pokes out to us. He's just such a lovable, amazing character. He's only in the film for a couple of seconds. And you mentioned that you and your producer, he kind of stuck out to you too. And there's this sort of joking campaign that we're trying to find him and get him on the show. As you know, we've got some merch with him on it, which I sent you. You should be getting those shirts today or tomorrow. But thank, first of all, thank you. I will wear them. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo- I will. I mean, I get a big kick out of the fact that the director of the film now has one of our shirts with the Rome guy on. <laughs> so what do you, what do you remember about that dude? Okay. I mean, he stuck out to us too. He was, uh, here's what, <laughs> what I, I remember that was, I mean, it's funny. That's how, how, interesting is I haven't like brushed up on this, but I can recall that he was in the hallways in Providence. Now, when I went on the road with them initially, we we were doing East coast cities until we went out into the Midwest in the East coast. The there's, you know, these halls would be union halls. Uh, That means there's a union crew. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so if I was going to film the band, I could film the band backstage, but if I was going to film the band on stage, then you've got to pay the union. Then as far as they're concerned, whether it's one camera or 15 cameras, it's a film shoot on stage and the union gets paid for, for the film shoot. They, in other words, each lighting guy, each tech guy, they get an up shot, you know, like an up charge thing for it being a film night. It's just the way it works in, in with, with union. Okay. Right. So I couldn't shoot any of the goings on on stage, but I could shoot in the backstage and in the halls. So during the show, in order to like get some useful footage, I would go out into the halls. And in, in one case, I think it was Albany, I went in the parking lot. That's where, do you remember like one guy almost falls down? He's in the parking lot, a bunch of crazy guys. It was like, mm-hmm. that was in a parking lot in Albany because I couldn't do anything in the building. Right. But in Providence, I could walk in the building and I figured, okay, it's a good time for me to get interviews with, with um, the, the fans, which I wanted to get. And so I'm marching through the halls and I see Fuzztop there, and I forget if he if he gave his name. He probably did. Um, and I and I gave and but he was just like I was I was kind of just standing there and talking to people. And of course, like when people would see me, and I, I'd have my camera and, and a sound guy, and I'd have like the the laminate, and they knew who I worked for. And you know, it, 
they, they just would come up and want to talk. And I asked him, I, I just, now when he started to speak, he, his voice was incredible. You can hear his new England accent, but mm-hmm. yeah. it's like that voice, you know? So, and, and <laughs> just the hair, he was awesome. So, you know, I talked to him for a little bit and then, you know, he was just one of many guys. But when I got back to the edit room, um, my editor, Sean Fullen, um, just kind of, he jumped out at both of us. I mean, we just knew that like this guy's gold and we got to use it. That's the kind of, <laughs> we just go, this, we always, we've been doing this for years. We're like, this guy's gold and he's getting into the movie. And we would do, we did it with murder in the front row the same way. And so we just, we just, you know, kind of put some of in the, in there and he's always been like a, a, a a standout character to us. And there's, there's certain lines of dialogue from, from that movie that, that stand out. But fuzz top is, is one of them. I didn't remember the name. I, I knew we had a name from when you and I started um, emailing Clint, I, I, I took the picture of the shirt and I sent it to Sean and he remembered right away. He goes, Oh, that's fuzz top. He goes, you got to get me a shirt. <laughs> I, well, listen, the, the exciting thing right away from that story is we have our first clue as to where he was at one point in life he was in providence rhode island he's in providence so we can hire a private detective yeah we need to hire a pi to find rome guy yeah we're going to come back to the documentary but i definitely want to talk about murder in the front row too and and dude i i i just revisited your um so you also did hit the lights the making of through the never uh film which i found just as interesting as the film everyone should go check that out it's in the bonus features of the film and it's also on metallica.com I mean, we don't have enough time for me to ask you all the questions I want about that. But so you leave this documentary. It's hugely successful. I mean, I told you in an email, this is every bit as burned into my aesthetic of Metallica, probably because of my age. But also, I didn't have any there weren't there wasn't anything like that that I can think of Mm -hmm. of my favorite band before a year and a half in the life. Am I missing something like what kind of studio and live expose on a band that big existed before that that's a great question the only thing so i'm i'm sitting there when i got the gig so to speak i said let me especially when i had to then go edit it i go let me look back and see who's done anything and it we, there was nobody like now it's kind of common because it's so much cheaper to film things but um i had to go all the way back to the now this is like 1990s i had to go back to um uh, the Beatles may, may in the, the film Let, it, Let be. it Be. I got a bootleg copy yeah. of Let It Be, and that's them making the the, the Let It Be album. Um, a year or two before, Aerosmith had released something. It was shot on very cheap video, and it was not very good, but it was called The Making of Pump. And they had like handy cam video cameras, so it's not it doesn't really look good. It's grainy as hell, mm-hmm. and it's called The Making of Pump, and it doesn't really give you that sense. It looks like it basically looks like. Pump was a very successful, you know, record for them. And somebody had some footage, threw it together because it was another piece of product that they could ride on to that. But um, I don't think, you know, I love Aerosmith, but I'm going to say that I don't think that film was like a great, you know, exploration of them in the studio. I'd love to see a great, great one. But um, there really wasn't anything. And, you know, you come to years later, you see stuff. Um, I've had people over the years tell me that, uh, especially people who who went on to work in the music business, that they became like that they uh, they learned how to engineer a record and learned how records are made from watching a year and a half in the life of Metallica. They learned wow. the process, and for that, sure, that's what I was trying to get. I I knew that a Metallica fan's going to love this film, but I wanted more people to lo- to be able to watch it than that. And so I knew if I made the film kind of about a process of how you do something that people who maybe don't care that much for this music but will like the film and i've had enough people over the years tell me that they may not have been fans of the band um, or maybe became became fans after watching it but certainly were not diehard metalheads and they really enjoyed the film you know and that that means a lot to me that's amazing well and you know ethan and i make records all the time uh, we, we we're based in nashville and it's just mm-hmm. it, it's weird now if you don't have someone in the studio making content it's just a, a missed opportunity now because when people are rolling out records, they're like, well, why not have someone in there filming it and getting mm-hmm. interviews? And yeah. it's interesting to think about your film as almost like a pioneer of that, something that's so ubiquitous now. Yeah. So I wish we could talk more about the Hit the Lights documentary. Everyone needs to go watch that. It's an amazing job that you did on that. Um, so let's get to Murder in the Front Row. So mm-hmm. these two dudes have this book. I mean, how did this come to be? How, how did it? Did you get the book and you were like, holy shit, there's a movie here? Or did someone <laughs> approach you first? Or? No, what you just said. <laughs> 
Okay. I got the book, and I'm like, holy shit, there's a movie here. Uh, that might have been my exact words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was. So who do you reach out to first? You reach out to Brian Liu or, or Harold? or Brian Liu handed me the book. We were, we were actually at okay. the Hit the Lights because I was in – Brian Liu and I had met at the um, the Metallica uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. We were fans of each other's writing because we had each written articles in So What magazine, the Metallica magazine. And I really liked the article that he written about his early days with the band because that kind of filled in something for me. And I, and I liked the way he wrote it. And I wrote something um, about that you know, first meeting with Lars and James and everything. And he liked that. But anyway, so we meet. We're friendly. We meet again at um, – it was backstage in Vancouver when they were filming – the part of hit the lights, the actual, they were filming the, the, the real stage show of, of, uh, of what was through the never. And I was setting up, I, I had shot interviews with the band members and, and, you know, and Dane DeHaan the, from the movie side and all this other stuff. And he, I, I run into Brian Lou and he's like, Hey, you know, we're like, Hey, what's up? He's there. And he had, the book was now out and he had a copy of the book. So I actually was like, holy, holy shit, I, I got Brian Lou and I have a camera crew set up. So I was like, let me interview Brian Lou because it's going to be so cool to get an interview with a guy who saw Metallica when there was like no production, when production was like mm. a banner behind them, you know, mm -hmm. and that was it. And now like this huge, you know, stage with all these, you know. Now with Tesla coils. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine putting some Tesla coils in Rufy's Inn. My favorite thing on earth was the Tesla coils. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my favorite segment. So, um. Anyway, so you have this great idea for the movie. The the pit, I can imagine the pitch is just a, such a great idea. Mm -hmm. How do you? So I'm I'm guessing getting Metallica on board was a pretty big part of it. Maybe of getting a producer or getting funding. Yeah, you got to get funding. I mean, maybe give us the quick Cliff's notes of like you have an idea for a movie. How do you get it? How do you start to get it made? Okay, so I I loved the book and I thought it was great. I con I contacted Brian, but there's still a bunch of time that went by between when I told them I thought it was great and could be a documentary to me actually doing it. And um, I, I, when I got the book, I thought this, this is great. And this is, this is the way in. I asked him, he was interested, but Brian was very interested as was Harold, who I met later in the story being told the right way. Now I knew that whether I make this documentary or anybody makes this, doc this documentary, you're going to need to get Metallica's cooperation to make the documentary. And I pretty much figured I could get that. I, called up management and I had a, a brief discussion and just, it was, it was something like, if I go make this movie, will they, can I get an interview? And it was like, they were like, yeah, but not the first interviews. You know what I mean? I said, no, I don't want the first interviews. I got a whole, whole lot of fans to interview first. So they were like, yeah, eventually if you go, if you go make the movie, we'll, we'll, we'll sit for you. You know, something will happen. I was like, by the way, in all of my entire years with, with working with this band, that's the only time I've ever like, asked for a favor in that way. You know what I mean? Wow. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, uh, again, great, very grateful that they granted it and very nice that they sat for me. Um, I got the money together. You know, I, it's a lot of it's personal money, so I, I won't get into that, but you just have to know that you can pull it off and, and make it happen. Um, I've spent my life making films. I knew I could make this happen. And then, so you produced it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the executive producer. I am my producer, Jack. Gould. So I just want to point out the same team that, that did year and a half in the life of Metallica, you know, all these years later, 25 plus years later, we embark on, um, on murder in the front row. And the reason I think it was successful is because what you have to understand about the Bay area scene is that the bands that were successful there, the reason bands were successful there is because there was this scene, because there was these diehard fans that, created an atmosphere that was conducive to the, to the bands being successful. Um, Metallica didn't just pop up. Metallica was struggling in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They went to, you know, almost by accident, wound up on a show in San Francisco in the Bay Area, as we, as we know, and they were given such a great reception in, in the Bay Area that it like opened their eyes to the possibilities of what could be. Mm -hmm. it, it, it says so much about the whole Bay Area experience and the, the musicians there that within six months of playing in the Bay Area, Metallic is already 50% a Bay Area band. They've, they've, they've recruited yeah. um, Cliff Burton. They've recruited Kirk Hammett into the band. And they're 50% a, a Bay Area band. And, of course, they, they come to live in the Bay Area and, and right. do all their, their important work there. So 
there must, you know, something was going on, and what was going on was a like-minded scene in, in Los Angeles that wasn't there for them. But also finding that scene was bands like Slayer, um, when Dave Mustaine formed Megadeth, he knew where to take that new band. He took it right up the coast to the Bay Area almost immediately. Um, and, you know, and same with many bands. And I, my, one of my absolute favorite quotes from uh, Murder in Front Row is what Gary Holt says, which is he goes, um, the Bay Area was the center of the thrash metals movement scene. And he goes, if your own area wasn't welcoming of you, we would be. So Yeah, I liked that too. I, I, I just found that so powerful because – Really, the, the, the guys who, you know, Metallica got very successful and they were already, they, they kind of found a lot of success in Europe. So they kind of very quickly, they, yeah, they became a Bay Area band, but they moved, they were away in Europe much of that time, if not playing, then recording, because they started making their records there. Of course, as we all know, um, you know, uh, Ride the Lightning and, and, um, mm -hmm. and, and Masters. But the ambassadors of the Bay Area scene became Exodus. And so you see it in the playbills, the, 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 you know, the, the flyers, it's like Slayer and Exodus and, you know, Megadeth and Exodus. And, and, uh, you know, it was basically everybody who came to town, Exciter and, and, you know, whatever, Anthrax and you name it, whoever it was would play with Exodus. And it's not that Exodus didn't tour because they did. Um, and Metallica definitely broke open the doors for like, for, you know, there to be successful thrash metal bands, but Exodus were very much the ambassadors. So this, so this band that Kirk Hammett started and then left, but left in very good hands with with Bailoff and with uh, and with uh, Gary Holt and Gary yeah. and, and, and and you know these guys just continued it, and they really were like the the hometown band and and really kept the fires burning in a very powerful way. It's it's a kind of an underground con until this film. It was kind of an underground conversation. I mean. <laughs> We, we even deal with it. We call them the metal police, people who correct us. We talk about Metallica invented thrash. There's always some, yeah. and I say this affectionately because I am one, but there's always some nerd that's like, actually, you know, Exodus bonded by blood. Yeah. And it's what's cool is that none of these bands ever had anyone tell their story until this film. Mm -hmm. And dude, we we sort of know about it because we are we do a Metallica podcast, but when we all sat down to watch it, the episode's, fun, the episode's what drops tomorrow or Monday, but it's funny because we don't talk a lot during it. We were just all like re legitimately watching it and learning it. One of the things that poked out to me too, because the you're a filmmaker, you of course, but like the pacing of it's really good. It breathes really well. Mm -hmm. um, I love the animation in it. Animation was great. Who came up with that concept and who did it? And the animation is one of, uh, of my favorite things, and certainly something that that um, a lot of accolades, a lot of people have said that they they you know it stuck stick out to them. I love your cup, by the way. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got the whole set. My wife. Uh, to my wife's chagrin, I have the whole set. Yeah, I, I know. Well, kiss, man. First, first concert. Anyway, um, what year? What year? If you don't mind telling no me, no problem. Nineteen seventy-six. Rock and roll over. Holy shit! I know. Twelve years. in New York, Nassau Coliseum on Long Island. Nassau. I, 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 it was, it was also another kind of the same. I was probably around the same time I saw like uh, the Woodstock movie, and like seeing Kiss was like that thing that just you know. It'll change your life. Yeah, exactly. You guys it change change your whole life. Confirms, yeah. It confirms everything that you 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 thought and that you now want to do. And you, I just knew I had to have a piece of this thing, and that that was that was rock and roll. Awesome. Couldn't have said that better myself. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I saw them when I was thirteen, but on the reunion tour, ninety six. Also great. I saw that. It, it was basically just love. They just redid the Love Gun seventy seven. So. Uh, but we could talk for a long time about that. Sorry, I got distracted by the cup. So, um, <laughs> yeah. very quickly, there's an animation uh, studio here in Brooklyn, and um, and there was a guy there, Mike Wartella, who got it. The, the studio is called Augenblick Studios, but the guy was Mike Wartella, who's actually uh, an Austin, Texas dude, has since moved back there. But he got it. There was something about it when we we showed him the the clips of the movie, and I described what I wanted, and I used some of the flyers and said, you know, this aesthetic has to be part of it, and the first big animation he did was the the, the guy of uh, of um, of Skitchy, the one who had the boombox on his head, and he did like mm -hmm, some, yeah. some drawings of that. And he just got it. There was something about his style that was raw and punk, but metal. But he just he just got the whole aesthetic. Cool. And once we saw, like, we were only going to do a few animations, but once we saw that, we said, okay, these guys can do the titles. These guys can do more animations. 
and it just became a, a really great theme. And they even did like the maps, you know, that were kind of physically done, but you know, where the van trip dries tri- tri- out yeah, the five. Yeah. So they really, they really got what we were doing and really contributed a, a great deal to the movie. Yeah. That really stood out to us like crazy. I mean, we were, Every, almost every time an animation segment would come up, we would like look at each other like, gosh, the animation is so cool. And and like you said, because the guy kind of got it and dove into it, and you can tell it was very thought out. And uh, you know, yeah, that that dude spared no expense into putting his craft into those animation segments. And a, a, a plus to him, he gets an A plus from Metal Up Your Podcast. I'm sure he'll be very pleased to hear that. Uh, he actually will. Uh, <laughs> was there anyone? Was there anyone that you wanted to get to interview in the film that that maybe scheduling or whatever that you couldn't get? Uh, I was thinking about Rama Govney in particular, mm-hmm. someone who who might have been there to tell the story that wasn't available. Um, I I didn't actually reach out to Ron, and it wasn't. Um, um, here's what I had to be careful of: it's not the Metallica movie. It's a movie with Metallica in the story, but it's not the yeah, Metallica right. movie, and it's very difficult because they're very powerful um, in terms of their charisma. And their their you know and their story itself is so great, but you don't want it to overwhelm the thing. And and I and I'll just tell you, I struggled with that through the entire editing process. To yeah. Not go to them to tell that piece of the story because it it it's it's like too much of them, and you know you have to get some other voices in there. So um, I've I've never interviewed Ron. I might have met him briefly at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but um, I really wanted to. There was nobody that I there was people that would chase for a while. And what happened was, you know, as I said, I interviewed like basically the people you would consider fan or supporters first. That's the artist who was supporting them. Mark DeVito. It's like, it's like people in the scene, you know, Harold and, and Brian and all those early fans. And it's great. Cause everybody had that early experience, including Kirk that, that we had, that I know you guys had, which was going to the record store and finding records that you loved. And like mm-hmm. that theme is so universal that, when I showed it in England, everyone was like, oh, that's me. That was me. And when I showed mm, it in Greece, yeah. like, oh, that was me. I used to go to the record stores and go to everybody. That is universal. By the way, and it works with comic book people, too. They had the same experience that they went to comic book stores. That collector, that that wanting to know more and share mm-hmm. it with your friends. There's a powerful scene in the film when after Cliff passes away, everyone goes to that record store. That's what I to- just to be around people or to grieve or maybe buy a record. And I, that, that was a powerful moment for sure. Absolutely, That's right. Isn't that interesting? That's where they went. That's where yeah, that was our common place. And, and yeah. so, um, which is, again, we can't say enough, you know, support local record stores, man. They're, they're, they're yeah. still there. Um, so it, it was, you know, that this kind of was how the, how the film developed. So I interviewed so, so many of the supporters first. And then by the time I got to interviewing, you know, quote unquote rock stars and stuff, People were hearing that we were interviewing people the right way, that we were telling the story the right way, and that it wasn't going to be just a, you know, I think somebody else approaching this probably would have looked to line up a bunch of rock star names and go interview rock stars and then lean very heavily on the biggest names. And I I was, you know, really not going to do that. I, I, I thought there was a much fuller story to be told if you put in, if you put in like the... Um, all these other voices, which I'll say are as important as, you know, obviously James Hetfield is important. Obviously Dave Mustaine is, is, you know, important and Kirk Hammett. But I mean, I think, I think they're, they're, they're made better by the other stories being in there. The other voices of, of which belong to names that are not marquee famous, but are, but are, are important nonetheless. You did a great job with the balance. I mean, I, I mean, he, I mean, Metallica is my favorite band out of all the bands in the film, but I liked I liked hearing from everybody else, and I, I we 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 agreed on the episode that out of the Metallica guys who, like you mentioned, they have a little bit of experience doing interviews. They're pretty good at it. They know how to pop. They know how to make a story, mm-hmm. have a soundbite. But Kirk, in particular, comes off really great in the film. Absolutely, and I think part of that is his connection with Exodus. He he kind of has more of a story to tell. He predates Metallica in the Bay Area scene, right? Right. Well, I you know knowing more about his story as I, as I did and the photographs and everything I wanted, if somebody came away with something to understand that, that how important Kirk Hammett is and that he was, you know, kind of a powerhouse unto himself before he even knew who Lars, Lars and James were. He was like this, you know, this mover and shaker making stuff happen in the, in the Bay area. And he puts together, you know, Exodus and he, and he's kind of getting shows and making things happen and, uh, you know, nobody's surprised when they find out Lars did all that stuff because that's what Lars does, you know. But mm-hmm. it's, like, it's like Kirk is much more humble and quiet about it. And I, I think it's cool to know that he was, 
he was doing all that stuff and you know he was successful musically uh well before you know he he met those guys um so i think i i was very happy that 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 aspect came out and the other thing when when you asked before about like who i was trying to get I, I think I got everybody I wanted, but I, I I was most apprehensive, I would say, about getting Dave Mustaine because I don't know the guy, you know, and you know I, I was I was certainly aware that he might think of me as, oh, he's in Metallica's camp, he's Metallica's yeah. guy, and um, I I have so much respect for for Dave Mustaine because I you know I I I was not I didn't want to like dig up dirt that was I'm not a gotcha journalist or something yeah, I, I right. would just tell a story about music and and concentrate on that and. So the, the amazing thing about Mustaine is I, I didn't ask him. I didn't want to know about like, oh, tell me about getting kicked out of Metallica. I don't care. I To me, what's amazing about Mustaine is is look what he does. He goes back to L.A. and look what he does. I mean, he creates Megadeth. I mean, mm -hmm. it's incredible. I wanted to know all about that. And he talked a little bit about before, but not because I asked him, just because he, I guess, wanted he, right. He's an amazing, amazing player and an amazing Character. The early footage you have of Megadeth, like in clubs, yeah. I'd never seen anything like that. And I, I'm not a huge Megadeth guy, but I, we all love that stuff. All yeah. the Mustaine stuff. He came off great. great. Yeah, exactly. I wanted him to. I was glad he didn't. I'm, I'm very <laughs> thankful he did the interview. And Ellison's the nicest guy in the world. So he's, he's so nice. He's one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah, he's the best. All right. Well, let's try to. Everyone needs to go see the film. We're gonna. We will have already burnt down a whole episode where we watch it. Everyone needs to go see it. It's required viewing for for metal fans, for thrash fans, for sure. So we want to be sensitive to your time, Adam, which thank you again so much. So we'll hit some of these questions with the patrons. Patrons know what the deal is. They get to ask people like Adam questions. We have a bunch here. We'll try to, I'll try to skim through them. Michael Salazar says, which member of Metallica did you get along with the most? Or do you get along with the most? Um, it's a good question. I, I'm probably at this point friendliest in, on, a, on a personal level with uh, Rob Trujillo now. Um, now, now the longest serving bass player in Metallica and, and, uh, and he is, um, yeah, we've just developed a, a good personal r r rapport and, um, and you know, I don't, I don't know, I, I guess I've had the most interaction over time with Lars because he's on the, on the business end of like, here's what we need to do. And, and this has to get done and has to be like this. So I have a lot of easy communication, uh, that, but that said, I'm, I'm, I'm on an, I'm on a nice friendly basis with all of them, but, but those are the guys I, I interact with in a way, I guess more so, you know? Cool. Bobby and Ann says, hi, Adam, what's been your favorite interview you've conducted so far? The interview with Kirk Hammett is one of the most special things I've ever done. And I, I have had the privilege of interviewing Kirk a few times before uh, murder in the front row. And I always found him, you know, he'd be forthcoming, but he's, he's, a, you know, a quieter guy. I mean, he's just, he, 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 it gives you something a little different. And um, I sort of was happily amazed. He, I believe he felt when he sat down in front of my camera for murder in the front row that he was, I think he wanted to tell this story. He was in the right place in his life and in his world to tell this story of his early days. And I am so grateful for that interview because I have never seen Kirk that animated and I don't remember seeing another interview with him like that. So I think he really felt it. We felt the same way. I mean, without even hearing that story, you, you'll hear it in our episode. We we're like, man, Kirk just crushed this. Uh, really film. Did. All right. Aurelia Moreau asks, how hard was it to secure image rights, notably for Guns N' Roses in the year and a half documentary? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, were you having to sign, get shit signed or what was any technical details about that? There was um, for a year and a half in the life. I, um, was at that time working for obviously working for Metallica. Everything would go through clearances because that that product was coming out through um, Electra, which meant Warner Brothers. We, uh, yeah. you know, Warner's Warner's Electra Asylum. So everything, as I remember, would get looked over. We'd have to make tapes of it, send it up for to legal. It was called sending it to legal, and legal would go over it and they would say what we could do and not do. And there were things that we had to blur out and there were things we had to take out. And there was things that, that they wouldn't let us, you know, they said we can't clear, but the clearances were all falling on the legal department at Warner's. So if, if we were able to show that um, album cover, it was because somebody in a legal department at Warner brothers said, yeah, that's okay. That's cleared. We can, we can clear it. So, and also slash with a towel on his head. <laughs> 
Slash signed a waiver, so I guess he could. He was, you know, he signed a, a release, so we were able to show whatever with him too. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I was in the backstage. Um, and it was it was pretty, it's pretty funny with that thing on his head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan Stewart says, thirty years later, what are your thoughts on the opening foundry scene of a year and a half? Whose idea was it? Most importantly, where did that badass metal Metallica logo go? That was my idea. Um, I had to do an opening title scene. I had access to a foundry, believe it or not. And I, I just had this idea that like, if they would like pour it out of metal, that'll be cool. So it just seemed like the thing to do. We had an artist construct the, um, a, a Metallica logo, a fully rendered, you know, thing. It's like kind of, I don't know, paper mache ish. And, but done, I mean, it cost, uh, you know, whatever it was, uh, the art department thing, like a thousand or $2,000 it was made. Um, two specifications, not like spinal tap, you know, and, uh, and, and it was, um, my producer, Jack Gula got it done. And then we went and shot that scene and we actually got them. Yeah. Pouring molten metal and kind of made it try to seem like, like that. It just felt like there should be some scene, not having the band members in it. Cause you're going to see so much of the band members that, that it, it could have been anything, but I figured let's, let's go shoot this as to who has it now. I have it. And I still have that, that that thing and uh it's up in in a band room where it belongs it's always been up and i'm very proud of it so there's awesome you'll have to uh if you if you want to you have to send me a picture i'd like to see it i'll send you a picture ralph javetto says what's your favorite metallica project you've worked on and your favorite project outside of metallica Mm -hmm. um easy my my favorite project outside of metallica is is murder in the front row which i know involves metallica but it's 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 my project I've been very fortunate because I, you know, I always thought when, when I was done with year and a half in the life of Metallica, that, that it was great and it was wonderful. And that's it. You know, I mean, I, you know, go on to work for other people. And that was, that was it. And I, I'm very fortunate that over all these years, they still call me back. They certainly could, you know, they've worked with other filmmakers, which is great, but they, they give me a call back. There was one thing that was so special that it's, it's hard to say it's a, my favorite, but it's certainly a favorite because it was so crazy and unusual and only this band could pull it off. And that was in 2013 when we went to Antarctica and freeze them all. Freeze them all. Yeah. And it's like, I've, I've read a lot about Antarctica. I've just always been fascinated by the place. And you know, it, I mean, it, it's that kind of thing. It's like going to another world in a way. And, and so I always wanted to go there. It's, it's been on a travel destination. So imagine if someone said to you, you could go to Antarctica you can go with Metallica to Antarctica. <laughs> it's insane. It's it's like mind blowing. It's off wow. any chart that could possibly be. It'd be like saying, let's go to the International Space Station, but let's go with Metallica, you know? And so I, the fact that I got to go there and make a film with them in that crazy location that they figured out how to like do a concert in Antarctica, that to me is, is just an absolute favorite that I'll, I'll always cherish for, for my whole life. It's just Absolutely. amazing. Thing. There is one question just about that. Someone, Namarta asked, did they really forget to play Trapped Under Ice? <laughs> That's like kind of the running joke is they didn't play that. I, I don't know if you have any insider info on whether or not that was ever even in contention to be on the set list. I, I, I'm i sorry that I can't uh, shed light on that. I don't know. I, I certainly never heard it discussed whether whether yeah. or not they would play it. So I'll just say that like they played what they played at that show. Well, so... Uh, to wrap up, what's what's the future with you? What what do you got going on? People can find the film wherever, right? Where 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 all can they find the film? I mean, the film's available um, on on iTunes and uh, all these other platforms. You know, it's v- Vimeo and uh, and and on uh, Amazon, you can purchase it. You can also rent it to stream. We've also we made a really deluxe DVD package because my producer Jack and I are just like old school that way. And you guys will appreciate it. You guys go back to vinyl records, right? So it's the actual um, record, uh, the DVD opens up into like a really nice gatefold and there's photos in it and everything. And then we also put in a sticker and um, and a couple of, a couple posters, of posters and stuff. So it's really a, um, you know, a, a deluxe product. And also on that, we put like... <laughs> The, the movie's 92 minutes. We put another 92 minutes of bonus footage on there wow. because we're crazy and we love it. And, and we wanted people to have like even more stuff. And I didn't want to like 
lock it up in a can someplace where nobody could see this footage. So we made some, some nice bonus footage because we, we, you know, we love the metal fan. We feel the metal fan supported us and they, and they, they've, you know, we've heard a lot of people have enjoyed the DVDs as well. So available in a lot of formats and, um, and I, I hope people will enjoy it for a long time to come. Well, Adam, you and you and your crew did such a fantastic job on this film, man. I mean, I remember when me and Clint and our friend Paul finished watching it last week, I remember leaving where we recorded the episode at thinking like, I want to watch that again, like right away. You know, I, th- I thought it was that well done, that intriguing, that captivating. Um, and I, 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 I need to uh, get my hands on that, on that physical uh, copy of the, of the deluxe edition to see all that bonus stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's like uh, people said, it's like another film because the segments just, just jump right off from that. And I felt, you know, people, people should have that, that footage. Mm-hmm. So that's been, that's been uh, a real plus. I forgot what the other part of the question was, but anyway. Oh, just what, what's going on in the future? What can we look for from you, if, if you can say? This episode sort of started talking about the Beastie Boys, and I'm uh, very mm. interested in, in, in what you guys are saying about it, because I felt it's kind of time for me to like look back and write like my uh, feelings about, you know, kind of my recollection of how I, uh, with Manello, you know, directed the two Beastie Boys uh, videos. And really, not just that, but that whole time, it's kind of what we started talking about, that whole time at early Def Jam. Um, I, I really loved the Beastie Boys uh, book that they came out with, and I saw mm-hmm. the, the tour that they did where they talked about the book, and I saw the documentary that was on. Uh, the film is great. I thought it was great. And, you know, my feeling is that there's a whole piece of this that they don't cover, and indeed nobody's really covered, uh, because it was like those dorm days were like really kind of special and and cool. And I still have a lot of like stuff from them. So I would, um, you know, I I felt that's like, that's like interesting. Of course, you know, when, when COVID hit, you kind of look around and go, well, what can I do that? I don't need a crew and everything. And I do, you know, your podcast is one of those things you can do, you know, one of those things you can do. So I, for one would love to see a a murder in the front row style film about that New York kind of underground. Absolutely. I would love to see that. I would love it too. I think it's it could be done. You know, it was a great scene also. And yes, we'll totally be in that documentary. You don't even have to ask us. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, we'll of course be in it. Um well, thank you for your time, Adam. Congrats on the film and and again, the work you've done with Metallica is so important to Ethan and I and so many of us out there and I really appreciate you sharing some of your life and your story with us, dude. It's really cool. Clint, Ethan, thank you so much. You guys you're really, you know, great interviewers and great fans and I and I so appreciate that. And um, I look forward to you know hearing this episode, and I can't wait to wear my fuzz top shirt. That's really <laughs> awesome. Master, master. Adam Dubin, sweet dude. What an awesome dude. I mean, I feel like that episode is one of those things where you could just sit back and listen to him. I felt like that's like for the first like twenty minutes, I was just going, uh huh, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like his his story is just so fascinating, and intriguing with his history with Rick Rubin and the Beastie Boys and stuff. I just I got kind of caught up in the story where I forgot that I was co-hosting a podcast. Well, one thing I also really appreciated about him is he he obviously knows how to tell a story. You know, yeah. there's a big difference, right? You can have a lot of experiences, but um, you know, he he obviously has done a few press interviews before, so mm-hmm. he he knows how to get right to it. He knows how to make it interesting and. uh that just made for a great listening experience. We should start a new segment called Story Time with Adam. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Where it, it, even it's just like, well, what'd you have for breakfast? There I was, seven forty six a.m. Bowl of Cheerios below my visage. The sun had crested the horizon. <laughs> Try. We were trying out a new soy milk for the family. Do we go with silk or West Soy? Do we get vanilla? Do we get plain? Do we add a little bit of sugar? Is it gonna make? The Cheerio soggy. My daughter suggested almond milk. Apparently, if you squeeze an almond hard enough, somehow milk comes out of it. (laughs) (laughs) You can milk anything with almonds. (laughs) All right, let's get out of here. We love you guys out there. We'll see you next week. Do not forget, we are giving away two copies of Murder in the Front Row. All you have to do is go to iTunes and leave us a positive review. You can even write something like Clint and Ethan have the the most luxurious heinies in all of podcasting. You could write something like that. Yeah, because that's positive. You could write an inside joke about the show. A lot of people have written a lot of really funny things over on iTunes. Mm -hmm. And then also over at Patreon, we are giving away a deluxe box set for frizzle, for freeze. That's it. All right, let's get out of here. Let's do it. Adios. (laughs) 
you were our advisor, what would you say? Then I would say, delete that. <laughs>